All right, today I'm diving into some of the wildest moments where the judges served up more than just their usual slate of criticism. And with that in mind, I can't think of a better place to start than with this contestant from season four. Uh, Bright, I think she's gonna hate everything we do. So the episode kicked off on an already great note with my favorite kind of team challenge, a wedding catering challenge. God, I love the chaos that these bring. Now, to make things even more complex, the bride handed over a long list of dislikes. No, it's, um, the vows are much shorter than this. Wow. Wow. So. Uh, that is your list? This is Hold the on. list. These are my dislikes. No peanuts. No beets. No radishes. No celery root. No fennel. Now, she's certainly setting me up for a hilarious bridezilla joke here, but, you know, gonna take the high road. It's MasterChef after all, so I'm not gonna bring Hell's Kitchen vibes into a video like this. Anyway, each team needed to whip up two stunning entrees, one vegetarian and one non-vegetarian to match the appetizer and desserts quality. So James and Natasha were captains for the usual challenge-winning reason, and they got busy putting their teams together. In the last elimination, so you two are the team captains. Natasha, you've got the red team. James, you've got the blue team. But there was a twist. Each captain had to excuse one teammate from the challenge. James opted to bench Bree, while Natasha sidelined Chrissy. I'm pissed because I don't want to be in the bottom. I never want to be the last pick. I don't want to be on James's team. I feel like James is going to lose. I don't think he has that leadership quality, and uh, I have all the faith in And little did Natasha know that was the smartest move anyone this entire season made. But seriously, the pressure was on, since the bride was going to be tough to impress, let alone the judges. But who I really want to spotlight in this challenge is Lynn. Oh, Lynn, with all your kindness, you did not deserve what was coming. Well, as Lynn stepped up to the plate, the atmosphere was thick with anticipation. And given it was his first team challenge, you can forgive a guy for getting nervous. Not just because of the pressure or because the entrees were dragging, but also because he was just plain losing confidence. Two tables dragging the blue team's entrees. Come on! In danger of losing his first team challenge, Lynn is starting to feel the heat. Hey, sweat box. You're sweating. Look at me. On the food. Okay, young man? And out of the corner of his eye, the red team was making it all look so effortless. In danger of losing his first team challenge, Lynn is starting to feel the heat. Hey, sweat box. You're sweating. Look at me. On the food. Okay, young man? I know it's hard. You cannot sweat in the food. Yes, chef. So he started sweating bullets, but everyone started noticing that something was off about him pretty quickly. Sweating on the plates, he's misplating, he's making inconsistent plates. Who's plating that? That's me, I'm plating it. Okay, young man. Yes, sir. Are you blind in one eye? No. And if everyone with boots on the ground is noticing something, you better bet Ramsey is too. Blue team. They're complaining like mad. The blue team are now five tables behind. I don't want to disappoint our team, and having that pressure, it just builds and builds and builds. The stress has got to Lynn, and he's making unforgivable mistakes. But he had his eye on more than just his disposition. Lynn! He's down. Yes, chef. You're wiping the forehead again, and you're wiping the plates. No, I... I'm concerned about the health and safety. Try perspiration. That's what I was talking about. Yeah, I wasn't exaggerating or being metaphorical. It was literally dripping into the food. What made things worse was when Ramsey pointed out that Lynn had been using his sweat rag to wipe down the plates. Yeah, the dude was a dead man walking. I'm concerned about the health and safety. Yes, sir. I just watched you wipe your plate with your cloth. Yes, sir. Now, will you please stop? And everyone, even the folks the next kitchen over, were immediately stunned at Ramsey's sudden outburst. But, I mean, I get it. Lynn's error not only jeopardized the team's performance, but Ramsey's good name, too. All right, all that aside, show of hands who's surprised that Lynn is in the pressure test. Yeah, didn't think so. Anyway, he was determined to redeem himself, and he poured his heart and soul into his lifeline of a dish. That dish being a box of, theoretically, 12 macaroons. However, when it came to taste, the judges weren't exactly blown away. Lynn made sure to get the looks immaculate, but the flavors just were not there. Meanwhile, Johnny's macaroons were the complete opposite. 
He didn't skimp on the taste side of things, but the guy tried jamming all those delicate macaroons into the box in a fit of rage instead of cutting his losses like Lynn did to keep them looking perfect. Which, compared to all the sweat in the world, just didn't fly in the MasterChef kitchen. Lucky Lynn, right? Anyway, moving on. Here comes a passionate fighter in the kitchen whose early promise dwindled more and more as the competition continued. I'm talking about Jennifer Williams from season eight. Jennifer, describe your performance because you look like you're struggling. I was struggling a little bit, but I feel like that I paid a lot of attention and I tried my best. See, Jennifer simply couldn't handle any amount of pressure, but episode six brought the worst out of her. I mean, the contestants were practically sweating bullets. Thankfully, not into their dishes this time, when faced with a challenge where they needed to butcher and break down a whole rack of lamb. And that was even with Ramsay holding their hand at the jump. They also had 20 minutes to make it happen, which is like 20 times the amount of time that Ramsay needed. Anyway, if they were gonna pull it off, they'd get to skip the pressure test. So everyone dove in head first to try and get it done and take advantage of the opportunity. Now, from the jump, Newton was confident due to his knife skills and apparent ranch ownership. Check out how well that went for him over in this video I just dropped. Daniel hoped that his mother's teachings about lamb butchering would serve him well, and Yashika dedicated her efforts to her deceased sister-in-law. Anyway, when it came down to the wire, the judges started discussing the contestants' progress. Arone was confident in Newton's skills, though that confidence was misplaced, no spoilers, but Ramsey thought Reba was the real one to watch. But while they were doing that, Jennifer was completely melting down. I'm worried about Jennifer. Come on, Jennifer, please. She looks all over the place. Messy board, messy knife. I agree. She's kind of just hacking at the land. You have just 60 seconds. Yeah, if you look up the definition of tension, you're gonna see that clip in the dictionary. Don't ask me how they got moving pictures working on paper, they just did. Definitely no need to fact check me here, no sir. Anyway, after time ran out, Jason managed to walk away with a thumbs up. However, Jennifer wasn't so fortunate. Jennifer, describe your performance because you look like you're struggling. I was struggling a little bit, but I feel like that I paid a lot of attention and I tried my best. So let's cut straight to the chase. Those bones look terrible. There's still meat on the bone. They are caked in sinew. And you haven't focused on cleaning any of those bones. Yes, sir. Are you that sure? does not look like the Rolls Royce of lamb. That looks like a dog chew. You are definitely not heading up on the balcony. Honestly. Yeah, I don't think they could have put that more bluntly if they tried. Well, Kate and Yashika got praised for their own standout performances, everyone else had to gear up for the elimination challenge. And if you watch that video I just mentioned, you know exactly what they were expected to do. Yeah, butchering is one thing, an important skill for sure, but it's what you do with it at the end of the day that really matters. But Jennifer, well, she had no idea what she was doing. Did you get keys? Jen, deep breaths, you got it. Jennifer isn't the best under pressure, and she gets frazzled in the kitchen all the time. Put that quick in there. My biggest demon in this competition is my memory, trying to my best to remember every step that Chef Ramsay had said. And since it was yet another recreation challenge, that memory of hers was kicking her ass yet again. My memory, trying to my best to remember every step that Chef Ramsay had said. And if I don't, that's it for me. I could be going home. Come on, Jennifer, please. Come on. She is a flurry. Oh, good luck. Okay, watch the back. I'm worried she's gonna crumble. But leave it to Christina to try and help calm down a panicking contestant. Jennifer, look at me. You can do this. Listen, you do your best when you're focused and when you're confident. This doesn't have to be your last night in the kitchen, okay? I don't want it to be. What are you worried about in terms of this dish? When do I put this lamb on? Like, my mind is like, do it now. Okay, so let's talk through it. How long does it need to sear the first time? Two minutes. It's okay. not even. And then what happens next? You put it in the oven for four minutes okay. and then take it out. And then you must it and crust it and then put it in there for four minutes. You got it. 
Don't let that other voice in your head get you. But for all the sweet, honeyed words in the world, she couldn't have prevented the inevitable from happening. Jennifer was actually visibly trembling as she presented her dish. Well, Ramsey's face said it all. He wasn't impressed. And he put that in no uncertain terms. First of all, have you ever been in an airplane where it hits turbulence and the thing starts nosediving? No. I have. Watching you cook across the last 60 minutes. Are you confused as much as I am right now? Though, despite those harsh words of his, Jennifer managed to scrape by and avoid getting the boot. I am kind of a lost for words. The only thing I could think of is, is that I get panicky because... Why? You take people's possessions away for a living and you get yourself in a tiz cooking a piece of lamb? Are you ready to quit? No, I don't want to quit. I'm not here to quit. I want to be here. You do? Yes, Then sure. stay composed. Okay. But not without a stern warning to pull herself together and start showing some confidence in the kitchen. And, well, sorry to spoil yet another thing for you, but that didn't exactly happen. That's definitely a story for another time, though, considering her elimination was less angry and more... sad. Anyway, on to the next. They get a taste of Americana running the kitchen of an all-American diner. We are open for business. It's a classic menu. One club. It's a chaotic kitchen. Two pancakes, you hear me? Got it. With hungry customers. Can I join you for desserts? Absolutely. One team will be sunny side up. Deep blue. Oh, you guys, y'all amazing. And the other will get fried. Toast is burning. Table two is leaving in one minute. I'm talking about Season 5, Episode 8, when the top 14 contestants rolled up to Dinah's family restaurant for a team challenge. But considering they were going to be working in an actual restaurant setting, Ramsey decided to get a little Hell's Kitchen with it and split the home cooks into the infamous women's red team and the men's blue team. Now, Willie and Christine were chosen as the team captains, but Ramsey wasn't quite satisfied with the lineup. So he threw a curveball and let both teams swap a member with each other. That's not going to cause any drama at all, I'm sure. Anyway, on to the real meat and potatoes. Well, not meat and potatoes exactly, since they were serving up a brunch menu. Fried chicken, scrambled eggs with bacon, pancakes, and club sandwiches. The usual kind of fare. And here's another twist that I haven't actually mentioned yet. The winners were decided by how many tips they managed to rake in. Well, the red team pulled in $87 over the blue team's 82, so they managed to squeak by with a narrow victory. And if you don't think the blue team was headed straight into a pressure test, well, welcome to pre-season 12 MasterChef. It's much better over here. Anyway, Willie, who was the captain of the blue team, had some tough decisions to make. He let Daniel, Victoria, and Francis L. off the hook with a free pass to the balcony, leaving Leslie, Cutter, Dan, and most importantly himself to face the heat. Yeah, Willie was a class act. Love the guy. Anyway, when I say heat, I mean it. Not in the dish, mind you, but try 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 to 35 minutes. It was a red velvet cake with at least three layers. And well, I don't think I have to tell you how challenging it is to make a cake from scratch. Now, Willie, for as classy as he was volunteering for the pressure test himself, also did it for a pragmatic reason. He knew he could crush it, and boy was he not mistaken. Leslie followed suit, leaving Cutter and Dan to fend for themselves. And I mean that in the most literal sense of the word. What's so funny? I just love how he doesn't even see his own mistakes and why everybody doesn't like him. <laughs> He's a one-trick pony. Okay. I, I have to say, Cutter, I disagree. <laughs> you don't know me. So oh, don't I even know talk. You Get me. on everybody your horse and ride you. home. That's fine. Hmm. It is a good cake. Thank you. We're not here to moderate or judge wars between contestants. That's not what we do. I don't doubt that either one of them would think twice about literally taking down their rival if it meant moving on in the competition. It was that aggro. Anyway, on to Cutter's cake. <laughs> Cut the cake. Seriously, though, the guy thought he could get away with not having enough time for proper decorations by giving it the shittiest patriotic touch he possibly could. Okay, uh, Cutter, describe your cake, please. I made a red velvet cake with equal layers with a good cream cheese frosting. What is that on top? It's the American flag. 
Okay. Whilst I admire how much you love your country, I've never quite seen a flag like that. Yeah, I know. I ran out of time. And the outside of the cake looks like a hairy back. What is that? Yeah, I, uh... <laughs> I shouldn't have added it. Do you have a hairy back? Yeah, I do, actually. Is it modeled on the side of that? <laughs> Pretty much. Okay, uh... so, uh... The outside looks ridiculous. I'm hoping inside it tastes delicious. Well, it sure looked like a grocery store cake. And it was just as cloyingly sweet as one, too. Moist, delicious, but it is so sweet. I mean, take a little bite and just get a little gist of what I'm saying. It's sticking to the roof of my mouth and on my first mouthful. You've cooked the sponge beautifully. However, it's about that ratio, and you've got to get that balance right, Cutter. And this is when Cutter did what he does best, saying that Ramsay's opinion is invalid. So just visually, the frosting looks really heavy. I think it's a good cake. I don't think it's too sweet. Uh, I have to disagree with Chef Ramsay. I think it actually tastes pretty good to me. I think just everybody has a different palate. Which was the perfect opportunity for Joe to come in and completely ream the guy out. But I mean, it's, I think it's one thing if somebody gives you their feedback for you to be humble enough to say. Right, that's why I'm trying to figure out where the balance just, is because just I just let know. me finish. And you don't want to just sit there and say, I stand by it. It's good. Because no, 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 then it's like, well, why does anyone not, give sorry, you Sorry, that's not what I meant for it to come out like. I just want to understand what is considered too sweet well, compared with. Now you know that this is considered oversweet. You shouldn't have to shut the But if he had the gall to stand up so defiantly to Ramsey, you better bet he started mouthing off to Joe without a second thought. Are you the kind of guy who lives in, in, in a delusion? Like, if any time we tell you something, you're going to become so defensive. Look, I'm on the edge of going home. I'll be honest with you, I'm on the edge of going home. Baking sucks for me. I do get, get defensive because I do feel like I put my passion and my heart into everything I put in. If you think Gordon's pal is terrible, you're allowed to That's think that. That's not what I said at all. Don't put words in my mouth. <laughs> As for the other contestants observing from the balcony, well, they got a bird's eye view of the guy literally losing his mind for the world to see. It was a total meltdown, nothing like I've ever seen on the show before or since. And I know I haven't even mentioned the guy here, but well, for as awful as Cutter had it, apparently a too thick layer of frosting from Dan was the real straw that broke the camel's back, so obviously he had to go. Ugh, these decisions sometimes, you guys. Anyway, before I start getting angrier than the judges in this video have been, let's move on. The remaining 12 home cooks have been dropped off in Venice Beach, California. So this time, they were taking the MasterChef kitchen on the road to Venice Beach of all places. Where they're about to face a tough team challenge. Venice Beach feels great, man. You got the ocean, the sun. I feel good going into another team challenge. I just need a good team. The top 12 contestants stepped off the bus and were greeted by the sight of three food trucks just waiting to be commandeered for their next challenge. I cannot wait to hear about this challenge. Oh my gosh! And unlike the usual two-team challenge, they were gonna be split in three this time, separated by cuisine, with Mexican, American, and Indian being on the menu. And not unlike the Dinah's Family Restaurant Challenge that would happen two seasons later, the path to success would be through the amount of tips they managed to make. Anyway, over in the red team's truck, Stacy's ambitious vision took shape as she rallied her teammates to tackle a vegetable quesadilla alongside grilled beef tacos. Meanwhile, over at the blue team station, Josh kept it classic with chicken tikka masala served on naan bread with a side of coleslaw. Though, cracks began to show before long. Especially with the yellow team. Yeah, not my first choice for color. Still, they found themselves at odds over their slider trio menu, Monty and David especially. Why not just do one stunning burger? I think we want to show that we can pull out more than... But is it the same patty? It's the same meat. So, so it's just the garnish? And you're doubling up all that work just for a different garnish? David! This is a contest on volume. Yes, sir. And you shot yourself in the foot because you're doing two burgers for one dish. The Calypso Burger. The Calypso Burger. We decided to 86 the Calypso Burger. I think that's a great idea. I was worried about getting done in time. We're just going to knock out a great Texas burger. Zero burgers were on just two minutes before the service began. So you can forgive Ramsey for being a little short with them. Monty, how many burgers are on? We have zero burgers on. What wasn't short was the wait. 
It took all of 15 minutes into the service before they actually started serving. But that wasn't even the real issue here. For all that extra time the yellow team needed for their burger patties, they were coming out raw and soft as mush. Delicious. Uh -huh. This is serious. It's raw. And soft. Okay. And with that revelation, what little momentum they had got stopped in its tracks. Now we are going to get into absolute pandemonium. That is raw. And there's children at three, four, five years of age out there. I'm going to flip my lid. Get the team together okay. and get organized. Okay. Thank you. Though, with as much as I've harped on the yellow team, who actually won? Well, the red team. Though, with the kind of competition they were getting this challenge, it was inevitable. But here comes a challenge, individual this time, thank God, which was going to make her break one contestant's journey on the show. I'm talking about Season 2's Invention Test. Inside the beignet is um, coffee with chicory brewed pretty strong, mixed with uh, sodium alginate, and that's uh, set to cool, and that's dropped into a calcium chloride bath. So... Alvin. Alvin, Alvin, Alvin. Now, this dude is known for his self-proclaimed mad skills. The only thing that those so-called skills of his would succeed in doing is making the judges mad. Anyway, one of Alvin's standout attributes was his proficiency in molecular gastronomy, which is a fun set of words to say and fun to see when it's done right. Which, credit where it's due, Alvin managed to do more than a few times. It was also enough to get him quickly earning the respect of his fellow contestants. And I do also need to give the guy props for the innovative ideas that he brought to the table, and how he was willing to push boundaries of standard schools of thought. Susie even went as far as predicting that he would make it to the top five, a testament to the high regard in which he was held by his peers. And Alvin was undeniably a talent to watch out for, which made it all the more ironic that it was the invention test that put him on the back foot. Now, despite his impressive potential for creativity, Alvin struggled when it came to execution. And that's exactly what happened when this challenge came calling. So, in this invention test, the contestants were dealing with desserts. But there was a twist. Adrian, who won the previous challenge, wasn't immune from elimination this time. Is desserts. I feel really confident doing desserts. As a chef, you need to know how to do pastries as well as culinary, and I think I can do both. He was tasked with choosing an ingredient for himself and another for everyone else to work with. And what were the options? Well, stuff that's a lot easier to grasp than freaking corn, I'll tell you that much. Adrian had a choice of three ingredients to pick from. Pineapple, coffee, or nuts. Coffee, pineapple, and nuts. Pretty normal dessert fare. Adrian opted to go nuts and gave coffee to the rest of the contestant. And they are... I pick nuts. Is there anyone who is a little bit jealous of Adrian's? And before long, those scant 90 minutes they had started ticking away. Max, what are you doing? You got all cream over your nose, buddy. Yeah, a little bit here as well. There you go, excellent. Ramsey and his fellow judges laid out their usual expectations over on their stage, with Tracy and Alvin emerging as early front runners in their eyes. Because obviously, Alvin was the king of invention, well, Alvin's molecular gastronomy was back in full force, I'll tell you that much. Whether or not he was going to be able to execute this time was the question, though. Inside the beignet is um, coffee with chicory brewed pretty strong, mixed with uh, sodium alginate, and that's uh, set to cool, and that's dropped into a calcium chloride bath, which sets a gel around the sauce. Hmm? What is that? It's the coffee sauce, Jeff. On the other hand, Max kept things a little more simple, yet efficient, with a coffee-infused layer cake. Though, for the others, it wasn't all smooth sailing. Christine faced a setback when her pastry didn't bake properly, forcing her to pivot to a last-minute chocolate coffee mousse. Anyway, on to the tasting. Specifically, the beignet... the uh, creation that Alvin served up. And as Ramsay took a bite, his reaction was immediate and visceral. What is that? It's the coffee sauce, Jeff. It's extraordinarily bitter. There is like a coffee blood clot. Mm. 
yeah, leave it to Ramsey to completely destroy someone with the wildest combination of words I've ever seen put together. Coffee blood clot. Where does he even come up with this stuff? Now, Graham was a little more down to earth, but no less scathing. He knew that this dish was doomed even before it hit the plate. I think uh, the resting time may have set more of the alginate base than I would have liked. It's not because it's been sitting, it's, it's the fact that it was wrong before it even got put in there. At my restaurant, we use some of these techniques, you know? But we never go around and try to trumpet that we're using it. Because it works, and it speaks for itself. But things like this give what I personally do day in and day out a bad name. Whether it's got a cool ingredient or a technique or not, that's just bad food. Overall, total flop. With all the dishes tasted, the judges must decide the bottom three, one of which will be eliminated. In the end, Esther and Tracy were the big winners here, while Alvin, Max, and Jenny weren't quite so lucky. Now, while the judges deliberated, it didn't take long for them to rule out Max. No, Alvin's bitter coffee beignet whatever the hell it was and Jenny's raw coffee-infused tart were the much bigger standout. But honestly, it was inevitable that Alvin was going to get axed here. Sometimes less is more, and Alvin was always going for more, even to a fault. While he had no shortage of great ideas for his dishes, they rarely came to life in the way that anyone would have liked. Him, the judges, it didn't matter. Still, despite his early exit, Alvin's talent and intelligence left a lasting impression on his fellow contestants and the judges alike. And hey, here I am talking about him too. So hopefully, wherever the guy is, he's at least learned a little bit of restraint. Anyway, you guys shouldn't hold back here. If you're itching to share your favorite moment the judges completely blew up at the contestants, you know the drill. Get in the comments. And while you do that, don't forget to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications too, so you don't miss my newest stuff as soon as I've got it up. But until then, don't forget to check out this next one right here. It's even better.